So tax, what we're doing is, tax is actually, I mean, Christ, we've seen it over the last week or so, tax suddenly becomes on the agenda, who's getting taxed, who isn't getting taxed. Should we tax people more? Who, what is a tax? What isn't a tax? Is a levy a tax? Um, that's actually not what we're dealing with. We're actually just dealing with the accounting for it, which you could argue is a little bit of a dry area, but you know, there are still some interesting things we need to have a look at. Least of all, just how we actually do it and, and how you interpret some of this stuff. I would have thought my computer would have figured out by now, but I don't like that. But before we get into the accounting for tax, I thought I'd actually bring something up because it's quite topical. Um, I'd imagine most of us at some point along the lines have probably paid these guys something and something we should have a look at. Um, so you may, you may or may not be aware of um, the conversation. It's actually quite interesting. There's, there's a lot of good content goes up here. Um, so this is written by a senior lecturer in taxation law over at Sydney Uni. And this came out a couple of months ago because he was able to get access. I mean, it wasn't just him, but there was a release in the US of a whole range of Apple um, financials, which is notoriously hard to get a hold of. But anyway, so as part of, sort of some government action over there, they were able to make this, he was able to get access to this stuff. I just want you to because Apple and Google and quite a number of others, and they're just being, it's not they're the only ones, they're just being picked on because everyone knows them and they're big. Just between 20, 2009 and 2012, so not very many years, it got away with generating $44 billion worth of revenue and not paying a single dollar in tax on any of it. You know. In a way, you could argue good luck on them, good luck to them. The thing I want to, I mean, have a look at this. I'll, I'll put a link up for it later on. I just want to focus on this bit because if you are doing ABC, this actually links to that. Um, and I know this isn't ABC, but it's still relevant nonetheless. Picking up intercompany transactions, intergroup transactions, transfer pricing, because that's actually some of what's happening here. It's not the only thing that's happening here, but it's one of the things. Um, so the tax structure of Apple designed to, designed to ensure that little income is left to be taxed in non-US markets like Australia. So if you buy an iPad for 600 bucks, some of you may well have iPads or phones or whatever, but if you buy an iPad, he was able to work out, and you can go and have a look at the detail of what he's done in your own time, but that iPad would be purchased from another subsidiary based in Ireland for close to $600. And you can really clearly get why that's happening because that means the profit Apple is making on the sale of that here is not very much. And we know Australia has a 30% tax rate and it's a relatively high corporate tax environment. So companies will do what they can to shift profits out of those environments into lower tax paying, lower tax environments. Now, that subsidiary basically is nothing. Like it's just a shell. Um, there's nothing there, there's no factory. They get made in China and then that gets shipped directly to here. So it's simply a paper transaction that's going on there. What was then kind of interesting, and we won't go through all the detail and you can read in your own time, was that the way the tax legislation seemed to work in Ireland and in the US, it seemed to be in Ireland, and they've, from what I've read, they've changed that now or are in the process of changing that, that you got taxed in Ireland based not on the fact that your company was based there, but the fact of where the company was managed. So this company was managed out of the US. So they didn't have to pay Irish tax because where it was managed. But the US, you pay tax based on where you're domiciled. So because it was domiciled in Ireland, they didn't pay tax in the US either. So they're actually managed, and it's, that's a really simple thing. And they make, he makes a point that it is actually quite a simple thing. He just found a loophole and just drove right through it. Um, Ireland are changing that aspect of things and now it sounds like Apple are actually shifting some of their stuff to Singapore because they've got a low tax environment and it sounds like they've got a good deal on that as well. Upshot of all that is companies will move things around if they can to pay lower taxes because that is a cost of business for them. Whether you believe that is a legitimate cost of business for them, I will let you make up your own minds of that. I certainly have my view on, you know, you, yes you don't want to be paying 70% tax but I think Paying taxes helps pay for legitimate government functions. Um, yes, governments need to be held to account for wasteful spending, but a lot of governments actually provide useful services to the public. And 
if no one pays tax, it's going to be left on probably people who can't necessarily afford it to make up that difference. And that is an issue. As interesting as all of that is, that's actually not what we're dealing with. Um, we're dealing with something a little bit different, and I'll get to that. So the problematic aspect of it is, this is not a case where we have choice of the company to say, this is how we're account going to account for it, or this is how we're going to account for it. This is a situation where there is just a way that it gets accounted for, for the companies that we're dealing with. And it's useful to understand how that, com how that comes about, how it looks, what it means. So I'm just going to show you a, a sample of four companies, and these were just, they weren't completely at random, but I mean, I just went through and just tried to find companies that gave a good sense of this. Fortescue you may have heard of. So this is 2013 figures. Their profit before tax was just over $2 billion. The tax expense, so that's the number that which goes on the profit and loss statement. The tax expense was about $700 million. The tax that they actually paid that year was about 120 million. So we've already seen a divergence between the tax expense and the tax that is paid. That is one aspect that's just really important to get at. Just because you see a company saying this is their tax expense, that doesn't necessarily mean that is the money that they're actually paying or owe to the government. There's something more to it than that. So they paid 120, they owe the government currently about 550. So that, when you look at the paid and the, and the current tax liability, that looks like it kind of marries up a bit. Deferred tax liability is 220, and that's another aspect of what we've got to figure out what it is. If you've done ABC or are doing it, you've come across these things before, but we're going to look at it in a little bit more detail. Bendigo and Adelaide Bank paid about the same amount of tax to the government. Their expense was about 130 million, so they actually their expenses and how much they paid seemed to match up a little bit more. They still owed the government nearly 90. Their deferred tax liability was 100, and their profit was way lower. So we're so, it doesn't necessarily marry up to their profitability. AMP had a profit of about 1.3 billion. Their tax expense was about 700. So similar to what we see over in, over in Fortescue, how much they paid was about 150. So again, similar to what we see in Fortescue. Their current tax liability is really small. So that, whereas these two, you could argue, could maybe add up to this, these two definitely don't come close to it. Um, and the deferred tax liabilities was close to $1.4 billion. So quite a large deferred tax liability. Bank of Queensland, they had a tax benefit of $2 million and they still paid $153 million in tax um, and they made a loss. The upshot of all this is what you see expensed is not necessarily what you paid or even what you paid and what you owe and we've got to figure out what the hell these things actually are and are they legitimate in the sense that are they real liabilities because a lot of people may argue that they're not. So accounting profit by now, we've only got, actually, we don't do anything about accounting profit, learning the rules behind accounting profit from, from here on in. Today we're looking at tax and how we work out um, just the tax, that tax aspect of it. Next week we're looking at cash flows. At this point in time, you've covered all the basic aspects of main sections of financial reporting. You actually are now well along your way to knowing how accounting profit is determined. Tax profit is determined by a completely different set of standards. Tax law, revenue law, is a subject as part of the major. Taxation law. Any of you guys done taxation? I'm not going to ask you like what is the detail about tax stuff. Has anyone done taxation law? Okay, easy. You guys know all this stuff then. Um, but taxation law is different to accounting. So there are different ways that it's set up. And because they're different and the timing of these things may be different, and one example may be long service leave expenses. We know how we calculate long service leave expenses. You guys have done it. We did it in week eight. Probably useful to know how to, I would say probably useful to know how to do it for the final, but I actually can't now remember what's in the final. But it is part of the stuff that you need to know for the final. 
and you know that you see smaller, small amounts of expenses build up over time as you build out that provision. With the tax deduction you get from it, you only get that deduction when you pay it. So even though you may be building up this expense and this provision for 10 years, for 15 years, you don't get any deduction over that point in time. You only get the deduction when the company actually pays that long service leave expense. So what we're seeing then is a difference in the timing of those revenues and expenses as compared to what you get from the accounting then for the tax. And that causes, causes some issues that we need to deal with. So the upshot of all that is what we do for accounting is not what we do for tax. And I suppose this is a good place to look back at why that is. So, I know it's a long, I know I'm talking about tax and tax isn't one of the most sexiest things in the world to talk about, but we've got to, we've got to work through it. Why do we have accounting and financial reporting, so external financial reporting? Not, not just so I have a job, not so potentially you guys have jobs to go to, but why do we have companies providing annual reports? What's the whole point? Week 11 now. You should have some idea what's going on. Provide information. Provide information? Yeah, so the big thing is part of the framework set is, is to provide information to make decisions with. So to provide information to make decisions with, we don't need absolute accuracy to make those because we don't. As long as we're, you know, as long as that information is reliable enough that we can, funnily enough, rely on it and we can make reasonable decisions on it, it doesn't have to be absolutely perfect. So we'll give up a little bit of that reliability for the relevance of that information. Um, so the relevance of the information is really important for accounting numbers. So we see professional judgment come in. We see sort of numbers which are not exactly perfect. Now, I just put in, I know it seems a little bit late, um, but probably about a month ago, I finally got around to putting in my 2012-2013 tax return. Um, less said about that, the better. But why, I'd imagine a lot of you guys put in tax returns as well. Why do we put in tax returns? And it's not just for the fun of it, because trust me, they're not exactly enjoyable things to fill out. But why do we provide tax returns? Why do we have to do it? Oops, sorry. Yeah, we've got to pay tax on it. Yeah, they need to know. Somebody in, in the morning's class was like, so we know how much to get back from the government. Good on him. Um, I wish that happened this year for me. Um, yeah, so we know, I suppose the government knows how much tax we have to pay them. Now, for most of us, if you're getting salaries, you're getting some of that stripped out before it even comes to you. So you may well get a little bit of a return, but it's for the government to know how much basically you take from you. Accuracy in that case and taking away subjectivity is probably a little bit more, power, little bit more important because imagine if you get to start to estimate, and you, look, it's not to say there's no estimation in tax returns, there obviously is, but they're gonna wanna take out some of that subjectivity. So like long service leave, we know there's a whole range of estimations that go into calculating long service leave. You've gotta figure out what the future salary is gonna be, you've gotta figure out the likelihood of that person being there, you've gotta figure out the discount rate, you've gotta figure out that's about it, the probability that person is going to still be there. Like that's a huge amount of, sort of subjectivity that's going on. And that will give you an expense number and that affects your profit. But if we were to use that to also put in as a deduction on our tax, on corporate tax returns, they then have an incentive to start to just put in amounts and inputs that they feel will get them bigger deductions. So there's arguably a reason why you do see greater reliability with tax rules because you can completely understand what they're trying to stop. 